On July 24, 2004, I thought my life was over. I, I tried everything. I had this prolonged episode of depression which lasted five years. I tried 23 lots of medication. I had shock therapy. I tried everything. And what is quite extraordinary is, even though I believe that now and I did try to take my life, is that I now have the most amazing life, the most extraordinary life. I have rich relationships with family and friends. I do incredibly meaningful work. And what I've discovered is that although mine was a little bit extreme, we're all touched by this. And I want you just to reflect, if you know anyone in your life who struggles with depression or anxiety, just raise your hand if you know someone. And keep your hand up and have a look around. This is the same in every single talk I do. You know, we're all touched by this. And we're, yet when you're going through it, you feel so alone. So I want to talk a little bit about my journey. And the truth is, is that one in four of us live with it directly. So we've got about 240 people here. There's one in four is touched by this. And, but, but, but I think the thing that has been just fantastic is that it can lead to amazing insights, amazing transformation. And that's what I want to just reflect on tonight. I want to talk about the things that really helped me. And it was caring, and that's self-care. It's caring for those around you, whether it's work or whether it's in your family. And also walking and walking adventures. I didn't uh, tell Ricardo or Amy or Stacey this, but this is what Karen and I have on our fridge. We have this on our fridge. And you can see we're walking our way through. Uh, this is about, what would it be, about uh, 15 months old. So we've done Kepler, we've done Cape Town and the Safari Park. We've done the Three Capes. And we're heading here, Ireland, in April. So it is wonderful to have that. I can only endorse just having it visible. It's a bit, bit old uh, analogue and having it on the fridge. But you see it every day because I go to the fridge a lot. So it's, it's a good place to keep it there. I've had, I've been blessed to have some really wonderful friends. One, one of my really great friends was Ted, Ted Roshami. Ted, when I was in a psychiatric hospital, Ted was one of the few people, apart from family, that visited me. And we've done some amazing walks together. We, we, this was only taken about, um, about 10 days ago, to walk from Cowan up to Brooklyn, a beautiful, beautiful walk. But on one of our earlier walks, and when I was really in a bad shape, and the walking was a really important part of my recovery, I decided to write a book, and that book was called Back from the Brink. Because when I was really in bad shape, I yearned for stories of people who'd been through what I'd been through and come back from the brink. And so I did an Australian version. I interviewed people like Jeff Gallup, the XWA Premier, I interviewed Patria Thomas and John Conrad, gold medal swimmers, and that marvellous icon from the, uh, from the art world, Margaret Ollie, just an amazing lady who's now passed away. And everyone that I interviewed often, you know, that they had a bit of a revelation, and their, their grief, their experience was part of that revelation. In this book, I, I, I subsequently did three books, and this was an international version where I you know, interviewed people like Alistair Campbell, who was Tony Blair's chief advisor. I interviewed um, uh, Patrick Kennedy, who was Ted Kennedy's uh, son. And what I also did was ask over 4,000 people, what helped you bounce back? And I want to share some of those insights along the way. What was probably the most important thing for people was emotional support. This is where the caring comes in. I was very fortunate when my marriage broke down, where I lost my job, to have the care and support of my parents, Helen and Judy Cowan. 
and I went up and lived with them up at Foster, which is funny enough, is where Justin set off with his kayak. And they believed in me when I didn't believe myself. I remember, you know, I came out of a, um, a hospital, I remember being in the kitchen and saying to mum, why me, why me, why me? And she's only about five foot tall, but she just has this Clint Eastwood type stare. And uh, she looked into me and she said, I believe one day you'll use this experience to help other people. And of course I thought she was crazy, but she sowed a seed. And what was really wonderful about, in May last year, I spoke to a crowd about this size. It was in the Western Hotel in the city. I was senior leaders there. And for the first time I was able to have my parents actually come along. And Dad's now 88 and Mum's 85, so they're getting on. And so I told this story of what Mum said, and I just asked them to stand up and to, you know, really thank them publicly. And Mum goes, you should always listen to your mother. <laughs> They never stop embarrassing you, do they? They really don't. They really don't. But I was incredibly grateful. I really was. And through my books and through that story, I came to meet Gavin Larkin. I met him at a uh, coffee shop in the Crow's Nest. Gavin was tall, good looking, charismatic. He was the CEO of an advertising agency. But he shared with me, you know, a dark secret that he'd lost his father to suicide 15 years before. Barry was an amazing man. He was, that was his father. He was an ex-McKinsey consultant, high-level consultant to some of Australia's wealthiest people. And when he took his life, it really blew people away. But 15 years later, or 20 years later, Gavin was having to explain to his son why his grandfather, that the boy never knew, took his own life. And Gavin had this idea, though, and that was to create Are You OK? And he was trying to, you know, this was before it was just an idea, just a concept. But he just had this uh, fire in his eyes and he said, it's going to be great, it's going to be great. But I believed in it right from the start because I knew the difference that support from my friend Ted, my parents, my other family made to me. I really knew that was a, a big difference. So the tagline was a conversation could save a life. You know, we had no money, we had no employees, we just had this driving um, purpose to try and make a difference. And I remember going to, we launched it in 2009, we're actually coming up to 10 years, this is coming up for our 10th year, and we went to Parliament House in Canberra, and Gavin spoke first, and then I spoke about my experience and then Nicola Robson with the Health Minister at the time, she spoke about her experience. And we were talking about later, and what we said was, you know, I said, I really believe we should do something like this in the workplace. And Gavin said, yeah, me too. And Nicola Robson said, yeah, I think it's really important. And so Gavin said, look, I, I haven't got the bandwidth to do it, but if you want to do it, have a go. And this was only six weeks before the actual date. And so we just went for it. And even in that first year, we had over 300 organisations participate and have an Are You OK Day. It's just, it's very pertinent we have it here in this session here today in Bondi because Bondi is a very special place to Are You OK. You know, we had our first two or three Are You OKs were launched here. This was back in 2016. And I was talking to Gavin's wife, and as you may know, Gavin tragically passed away from cancer in 2011. But I say, it's extraordinary what's happened. You know, in that first year we had no money, and yet at this, this one, which was in 2016, we had videos from the Prime Minister, from Bill Shorten, we had every radio and TV station there. It just really captured something. I think it's the, the core of an amazing organisation that even though Gavin died, it's gone from strength to strength. You know, we now have an awareness of 78% of people, 78% of Australians know what it is. 23% of Australians have asked someone, are, are you okay? And as I was driving home from that, I distinctly remember thinking that if you want to achieve great things, tribes trump self. If you want to outperform, outlast, outmaneuver, tribes trump self. Like, I'm blown away by you know, Ricardo and Amy, who put this thing together. Give them a hand now.
they shared with me how this was just an idea and they just <laughs> decided one night over a bottle of wine, they're going to do this, to the point where they, they booked the next day, they booked the expenditure the next day and put it on. But they ha- can't do it by themselves. They put together a group of people, Stacy and all the other people around that were just as enthusiastic as them. So think about an amazing group or team or tribe that you've been in. What made it different? What made it different? Just have a chat with your neighbour for, for, for just 45 seconds about, it could have, been, could have been your year nine netball team, it could have been your footy team, it could have been working on a school fair, it could have been your current job or your last job. It's a, it's, a, it's a team where things just happen. What made it different? Take 45 seconds to have that chat. <laughs> When people speak to the, about those experiences, to see their eyes light up and to see energy come into their, into their being, it, it, it's wonderful to see. But when you think about that team you're in, and just call out something for yourself, I just want to think of one word that made it different, one or two words. What was one or two words that made your team different or better than other teams you've been in? Passion. Beautiful. What else? Purpose. Purpose. Trust. Yes. Fun. Oh. Pizza. <laughs> Pizza. I, I do this in, you know, in government departments, in banks and everywhere. It's always the same. And I think that it's never been no, more necessary to tap into what makes teams great, what makes us great. And you know what it is? It's being human. And it's when you think of that team, did you care about each other as a person? Yeah. Totally. And that's why I think care in the workplace is the new unfair advantage. So why is this so relevant? We're living in a different era. You know, we've been through steam, electricity, electronic IT, and we're now in digital IT and AI. The rate of change is only getting faster. And the implications for workplaces, and I'm mainly talking about, well, really all workplaces, is just that customers want more, they want it faster. It means we're going to collaborate much more inside and out. And that means that there's always restructures going on. And the end result of that is that it's very, very stressful. And these are real and robust figures. Only 13% of Australian workers, according to a Gallup survey, are actively engaged in their work, are actively striving to make a difference. It's not much better for managers. Only 35% of managers are actively striving. Trust is broken down. People don't believe, 82% of people don't believe everything a manager says according to a global trust index. And this leads to big cost in, in, in absenteeism and presenteeism with stress, depression, what have you. But what about if things could be different? What about if we could tap into what we just recalled before? What if we could recreate wonderful teams? Anyone follow the AFL here? Yeah. <laughs> do you do? I don't. There's only, I only know two rule, rules. <laughs> there's only two rules I know of the AFL. First rule is there are no rules. And the second rule is you get a point for missing. <laughs> but even though I'm not, you know, a, a, a real fan or follow regularly, I found the story amazing that the Richmond Tigers in 2016 came 13th. 
And their coach, Damien Hardwick, was pulling his hair out. You know, he was micromanaging people. People were, were, weren't going to try new things. It was a real disaster to the point where his wife said, you're not the man I married. And this really blew him away. And he realised that if, he, if, if the team had to change, he had to change. And so he decided to implement a remarkable thing. And it was called the Triple H Sessions. It stands for Heroes, Hardships and Highlights. And what he did was that he shared you know, his hardship. That at the beginning of the 2017 year, he said that 2016 was hell for me. You know, I didn't like losing like that. You know, I wasn't myself. And he told about who his heroes were. And he talked about some of the highlights in his, of his life. That began a session which basically transformed the culture of the Richmond Tigers. The next week, the team, met, uh, sorry, the team captain did the same thing. Incredible trust, incredible respect was brought, brought about through that activity. And, you know, the end game was that there was such a camaraderie that one of the younger players, who wasn't even on the first grade squad, he had an 18th birthday. And it was in regional Victoria. He sent out invitations to everyone, thought about five people would turn up. The entire playing squad, the entire coaching squad turned up. That was the sort of trust that was built. And it led to the transformation. They had a very, very similar uh, group, but it led to the trans that led to the transformation of the team. I've been fortunate in one of my other adventures, uh, this is in 2014, I didn't walk the Kakoda track for my son Adam, who's here tonight. That's us, two of us on the left there. And it was an amazing experience, you know, just walking in, 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 the, in the path of those diggers and it just having <laughs> no internet, no electricity, no hot water for, uh, for 10 days. An amazing bond build-up it was. Another very successful team or group has been Google. Like, I'm old enough to remember doing my first Google search. I was running an executive search business and a researcher came in and told me, found this thing called Google, you should see, it's amazing. And in 21 years, 21 years, they've become the second largest organisation in the world. Incredible um, innovation. You know, they had, of course, they had a search, but they've got YouTube, they've got Maps, they've got Gmail, self-driving cars. But what people don't realise is that 90% of Google's products fail. So they sought to understand what made up their best teams. What was it that really differentiated their, their best teams? And at first I thought it was individual qualities like IQ, EQ, diversity mix. But they get no correlation. As only Google did, they modeled 180 teams around the world with 250 factors for each team. And then some of the insight, maybe it's not the individual qualities, maybe it's how they work together. And that was the breakthrough. They identified five team norms, and these were the five critical things that all their best teams had. Number one was psychological safety, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Number two was dependability, that means we can rely on each other. Number three was clarity around outcomes. Number four was meaning, we related to the purpose of the organisation. And number five was impact, we knew that our team was making a difference. But by far the most important was psychological safety. And what psychological safety is, it's where we're comfortable being ourselves, where there's interpersonal trust and respect. We're allowed to try things, encouraged to try things. We make mistakes, people aren't sacrificed. It's just seen as a learning opportunity. They discovered the same thing that Richmond Football discovered, which you've discovered, that it's really human qualities, it's caring for each other that leads to extraordinary teams and, and changes. This is another one of our ventures. We, uh, despite my glib smile and Karen's body language, we're not feeling particularly psychologically safe. <laughs> but this was a magnificent experience of uh, last, last March, virtually a year ago, um, in, in Zimbabwe, where we had the chance to Work, walk with an 18-month-year-old lioness. 
So what do we do differently? With my first book, um, the first, epi first issue of Back from the Brink, I interviewed uh, Jeff Gallup, who was the ex-West Australian Premier. And as part of Jeff's recovery from depression, he went and spent some time in a Buddhist monastery near Perth. And he, he heard this story from Arjun Brahm. And it was about a young prince. And this young prince took over the, over the kingdom. And he was a very conscientious and well-meaning prince. So he had this desire to have some simple rules to manage himself, but also to govern the kingdom. And so he asked you know, all his uh, bureaucrats and advisors, but they just spoke platitudes. They weren't walking the talk, didn't, didn't apply. So anyway, he went out into the kingdom, walked in the, in the rice paddies, went to the markets, went round, and, and he had this revelation. He just needed to answer three questions. And the three questions were, when is the most important time? Second question is, who is the most important person? And third question is, what is the most important thing to do? And so he got the questions, but he had to find the answers. So he heard about this mystic monk who was based up in the Himalayas, as they always are. Walked all the way up there and said, Master, I've travelled the kingdom and I, I just need the answers to these three questions. First question is, when is the most important time? So what do you think the answer to that is? Like, we all know that intellectually, don't we? But how much of our stress, how much of our worry is due to being fearful of something in the future or regretful of something in the past? What percentage? Truck loads. <laughs> Truck loads, a lot. Now, the second question is quite profound, and not a lot of people get this right. Second question is, who is the most important person? So take for 40 seconds, have a, a chat with your neighbour beside you. Who do you think the mystic monk says is the most important person? Have that quick chat. <laughs> So who do you think Mr. Martin thought was the most important person? <laughs> Me? Any other, any other answers? The mystic monk said, the most important person is the person you are with. And so when you're with someone, your focus should be with them. But when you're by yourself, and how often are we by ourselves? The most important person is ourselves. Third question is, what is the most important thing? Third question, what is the most important thing to do? What do you think the most important thing to do? Serve others. Most important thing to do is to care for the person you're with. So putting it all together, the mystic monk said, the most important thing to do is to care for the person you're with. This ties in self-care, family care, work care. Brilliant. Now, what's really interesting is the mystic mark has been validated by science. This is a, a question by the Gallup organisation. It's, it's the most validated organisational performance question ever, ever asked. It's been asked over 18 million times in 135 countries. The more people that strongly agree with this, my supervisor or someone at work seems to care about me as a person, the higher the profit, the higher the productivity, the higher the customer service levels, and the longer people stay with it. So the Mystic Monk was very correct. So another adventure, just um, we had last year uh, in, in December, just before Christmas, we walked the three capes. Anyone done, done the three capes in Tasmania? On the list, fantastic. <laughs> I recommend it. Like, went with. Um, you know, five mates, it was an amazing time. Um, 
<laughs> rather carrying four litres of wine. <laughs> so that was good. <laughs> so that was particularly good. But it was a wonderful experience. So I want to talk about, you know, in terms of my recovery and what keeps me well now, is the caring. It's the self-care. It's the caring for family. It's the caring for friends. It's fulfilling work. And that's work working to your strengths. But it's also working in a culture where people are people and they're respected. And, and finally, the walking adventures were, was a very, very important component. Karen and I uh, went on this walk in um, uh, 2016. It was the Portuguese Camino. We walked from Porto in Portugal to Santiago. A wonderful experience, uh, 10 days, 230 kilometres. And this was our longest day. Um, on this day, we walked 37 kilometres. We had very busy lives, and so it was just a real privilege to be totally present. You know, we had no phone, no internet, and just to really experience the day and, and to, to look at the countryside. Next day, uh, we had another long day, we walked uh, 25 kilometres. And we came to this pensione, and we were very uh, smelly and sweaty when we arrived. And these, this couple here, Wolfgang and Elizabeth, looked as fresh as a daisy. And it's one of those marvellous travelling experiences where it turns out we were the only couple in this B&B. And we had, uh, you know, just an extraordinary night. And they were amazing. They were Austrians. Wolfgang sounded a bit like Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> But what was really amazing was that they had a, a spirit of adventure. They really had been to Australia four times and been on, been on um, you know, camper vans around Australia, been many other places around the world. We're about to go to bed and uh, they'll talk about it the next day and thought, oh, you know, actually, I said quite smugly, you know, actually we travelled from San Pedro two days ago, 62 kilometres, you know, um, so we're going to take it easy tomorrow. tomorrow. And uh, Wolfgang said, oh, so did we. <laughs> and I said, do you mind me asking how old you are, Wolfgang? And he said, I'm 81. 81. And, uh, and I said, look, just extraordinary. They went on to tell us how he'd been to Ireland the previous year. He got knocked back from driving a uh, rental car because he was too old. So he challenged the clerk to a push-up competition. <laughs> <laughs> but I said to um, Wolfgang, I said, look, it's just been a privilege to have this night with you. Most people I know your age are in retirement homes or getting ready to die. What's your secret? And he said, I just start. I just start. Now, I, we never saw Wolfgang again because he'd already gone when we got up in the morning. <laughs> but, and I don't know what his last name is, but it's had a profound impact on Karen and I. Whenever we procrastinate, we say to each other, just start, because just starting is the hardest thing. Stacey and Karen want what Amy and Ricardo have done by just starting. They've produced an amazing night like this. You've seen already what Gavin Larkin did with Are You OK? by just starting. Each of us can start amazing things if we just start. Thank you.